Ladies and gentlemen, um, good evening. Thanks for joining us from the comfort of your, your houses, um, your studies, uh, your lounge rooms. My name is Samantha Jackson. I'm the Education uh, USA Country Coordinator in Melbourne. Um, wherever you're joining us from in Australia um, tonight, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's an absolute pleasure that we have Mike Mitchell with us tonight. He is one of the US consular officers that's based here in Australia. Um, he's based in Melbourne, um, but he'll be talking about all things required for your student visa appointment, regardless of where you're doing that. That may be in Perth, that may be in Sydney, uh, that may also be in Melbourne. Um, we are going to have Mike go through a presentation for the next 25 minutes or so, um, and we will then open it to Q&A. So if you've got any questions in regards to your upcoming uh, student visa appointment, he can answer those directly. He, he cannot ask um, answer specific questions in regards to your personal file, um, so they have to be general questions as well. So on behalf of Education USA Australia, we are absolutely thrilled um, that you um, have taken the step. You are going to a US college. Um, if you are a parent of a child here tonight, thank you so much for joining. Um, and um, in, in, I'm sure it's going to be incredibly helpful and you can help prepare them for the upcoming uh, visa appointment as well. Um, so on behalf of that, I am just going to take myself off screen um, and I will share my screen for Mike Mitchell to join us. Mike, um, if you can introduce yourself, um, a little bit of history about yourself um, and what they can be, expect tonight, that would be fantastic. Um, ladies and gentlemen, over to Mike Mitchell. Perfect. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name, of course, is Mike Mitchell, and I am the Deputy Consular Chief at the U.S. Consulate in Melbourne and have been a member of the Foreign Service for uh, almost 12 years now. Uh, I have served in Trinidad and Tobago, in Seoul, South Korea, in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea, uh, and now here in Melbourne and have enjoyed it. I've been a consular officer my entire career, so I have a lot of experience, especially with student visas. Uh, Seoul, South Korea is one of the largest uh, student uh, suppliers to the United States in the world, so we had a lot of students from there. And uh, we've actually had quite a few student applicants uh, from here in Australia as well. Uh, and for later on in the show, I also have uh, two sons who have both applied for and gone to American universities. So I sort of have experience from both sides of the operation. Uh, tonight, uh, the first part of this program is going to be about how to apply for a student visa, and I'll run through a short uh, PowerPoint presentation. If anybody has any questions, I don't mind if you uh, stop, or I guess you can maybe text the, the, the question, and then I can answer it uh, while we're going along. But uh, feel free to, to ask any questions if you want, and we'll also have time at the end for any questions that you might want. Uh, we're going to have a slightly strange process for this because Sam is the one who's controlling the PowerPoint. So I'm going to ask Sam to uh, move on to the next slide. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, before people get too confused, Australia, and this presentation is specifically for uh, Australians uh, and most likely Australian citizens, although if you are not currently an Australian citizen and uh, are in listening to this presentation, I'm happy to explain a little bit about how, how it works for you as well. But for mostly this is going to be for Australians and Australians have uh, what we call the visa waiver program, which allows you to travel to the United States without even showing up at our consulate and uh, getting an, what we call an electronic visa. Uh, this visa allows you to stay in the United States for up to 90 days. And it's uh, basically the category is the same as a B1, B2 visa, which is good for business or pleasure. Uh, you apply online, you pay a small fee, and it's good for two years. The only downside is that uh, you don't get anything in your actual passport. So you have to remember when you applied so that you can remember when it expires. But other than that, uh, there are, it basically allows you to go for short trips without ever having to step foot into the consulate or embassy and you can renew it as often as you want. Um, so yeah, next. We, of course, are here tonight for the official student visas. Uh, there are many different types of exchange visas. Some are for shorter programs and others are for longer programs. 
the exchange visitor programs range from a camp counselor to university student. Uh, you can be, even be a doctor or a, a secondary school student. And then we also have the same summer work and travel program that some of you may have heard about, uh, which allows you to travel to the United States for up to a year. And as an Australian, you get to work pretty much anywhere you want for a year uh, uh, after you start university. So there are lots and lots of different programs. Uh, you can always take, uh, oops, wait a second, what's happening? Oh, uh, sorry. Is that you? That was me, <laughs> sorry. That's okay. Did it come back? No, we still see your screen. There we go. That's good. Um, yeah. So if you're not sure about which kind of visa you want, uh, the State Department Visa Wizard uh, can assist you in that. And that's all. Also, uh, all the information is on travel.state.gov. Next. Perfect. So uh, the, the most usual student visa is what we call an F visa. And these are for pretty much any normal regular student who's gonna either go to high school or university in the United States. Uh, and just to be clear uh, on the vocabulary, since I'm speaking American English, uh, for Americans, high school is anything from uh, basically secondary school up to grade 12. And then after you graduate from high school at around the age of 18, you go on to post-secondary education, which can be either called a college or a university. Uh, and there are community colleges, which only last for two years. There are state colleges, which last for four years. And there are universities, both public and private, which generally last for four years or more. You can also be a graduate student. Um, so there are lots of different types of schools in the United States. But for almost all of these, the most basic visa would be the F visa. Um, in order to qualify for this F visa, you have to already be accepted at a school uh, and the school will send you a couple of documents that you'll need to present at the consulate when you have your interview. Uh, you're going to need to be taking a course of study that sort of makes sense. So if you just graduated from high school, you wouldn't be taking a PhD program in astrophysics. So that, that sort of makes sense. Uh, your stay in the United States is for a specific purpose and that you plan to come home at the end of your studies. Uh, you also need to have some sort of ties abroad, which would be like back home here in Australia. So family or if you have started a job and you're going to return to that job after you're finished. Uh, the, the kind of re, the ties for Australian applicants uh, is a lot looser than if you're not an Australian citizen applying from Australia. Uh, because the idea is that you're always going to return back home to the country where you started at the end of your studies. Um, sufficient knowledge of English, that's generally not a problem for Australians, even if you do use some funny words occasionally. Uh, and the funds for schooling, uh, many of you will actually have some sort of a scholarship. Uh, we've seen a lot of Australian applicants who get sports scholarships to go to American schools, and that, that's great. Uh, some of you also will acquire some sort of academic scholarship, and that's great too. Um, and then for many of you, your parents will pick up the rest of the tab. Next. So J visas uh, are a little bit different. These are generally for short-term programs or exchange programs. So if you're in a university in Australia and you want to spend a semester or a year abroad at an American university, generally you'll apply on a J visa. And for the most part, the requirements are the same, um, but you will have, uh, the forms will be slightly different uh, and you'll have less time in the United States. Uh, and if for anybody who's ever participated in the summer work and travel or the camp counselor program, they also go on J visas. So J visas, I think there's like 16 different categories in a J visa uh, and they range the entire spectrum of possible uh, work in the United States, but they're all for short term exchange programs. Whereas the, the F visa is if you actually intend to spend four years at a school and acquire some kind of diploma at the end. Next. <clears throat> 
So that's great. I'm sold. How do I apply for a visa? Next. So uh, to apply for an F1 or a J1 visa, uh, there are a couple of steps that everybody has to go through. First, of course, is to get accepted. And again, this is important. Uh, you generally apply for American universities uh, basically six to nine months before the school actually starts. So many, many uh, people even start thinking about schools uh, a whole year or two before they would be eligible to start their, their college or university in the US. Uh, and Sam can explain a lot about that process, but uh, it, it isn't something that you can just do at the last minute. Uh, in order to be accepted to American colleges or universities, oftentimes they will uh, make those decisions uh, again, six to nine months before the school year actually starts. Um, also, to a reminder for everyone here, don't forget that uh, the United States is on the Northern Hemisphere school schedule. So when we talk about start dates for American colleges and universities, normally the, the school year in the United States begins in August or September. Uh, and then you'll have a winter break around Christmas time, and then you will finish the school year in uh, between May and June, uh, and then you'll have a fa fairly long summer break of two to three months. So that's generally the opposite of how the uh, Australian school calendar works. So you have to keep that in mind as well, that there may be a six month gap in between your Australian system and the US system. So, uh, once you've gotten accepted and you've gotten some of the forms, uh, you'll go to ustraveldocs.com and create an account. This is the Australian system for uh, registering for, a, uh, for an appointment for the, uh, for the visa. And you'll do all of that through US Travel Docs. Uh, you'll fill out an online application form. This is called the DS-160. And that, there's the link there. Uh, this is also, you'll, you'll get this link through US tra Travel Docs, so you don't have to worry about that now. And you'll print out your barcode confirmation page. Please don't forget that because you're supposed to bring that to the interview. Now, next, uh, you will also go online and pay something called a CVIS fee. There are a number of different fees for a student visa and you will need to keep these straight because many people get confused and think, oh, I already paid for that, but you actually haven't. Actually, we can go back to, to number three. When you fill out the DS-160 on the ustraveldocs.com website, you will pay the first fee. Uh, that's the application fee, and that's 160 US dollars, and you'll generally pay that with a credit card online. Then you'll pay the CVIS fee, um, and that's depending on the type of visa that you have. Oh, no. Uh, sorry. There we go. Uh, it'll be uh, either, it, if, if it's for an F1 visa, you'll pay $350. Uh, and if it's a J visa, it will be between $35 and $220. Uh, and, and that is a security fee that doesn't go to us, but that goes to the US government to do all your background checks when you apply online. Uh, and then at the interview, you will also have to pay an issuance fee, but we only charge you that if you've actually been accepted and your visa has been approved. And if you're an F1 student, that's a $305 US dollar fee as well. So when you add it up, it's like 700, almost 800 US dollars. So it can be quite expensive. Um, uh, I'm not fooling anybody, but as you know, American universities are, can also be expensive. So just keep that in mind when you, when you start this process that there are different fees and uh, don't, don't, surprise your parents uh, each time you, you have to use their credit card again. Um, you'll attend your visa interview with all of your documents. Uh, we send you lots of emails with instructions. Please read the instructions and make sure that you follow them uh, so that you don't have any delays in your application when you actually get to the interview. Okay, next. So, uh, when we talked about the forms that you're going to get from your school once they've accepted you, uh, there are two different types. There's something called an I-20, 
for the F or M visas, and they look like the form on the left. And for any of the short-term exchange programs where you're going to get a J visa, that form is called the DS-2019 form, and that's what you can see on your right. Uh, both of them will contain lots of uh, biographical information about you. Please make sure that all the names and birth dates are spelled correctly uh, because this is part of your visa and if there are any errors it could cause you problems when you try to enter in the United States. Okay, next. So the CVIS program is run by the Department of Homeland Security, DHS, and this is a program that the schools and the State Department uh, both have access to. So basically what it, what it happens is when you uh, get accepted to a school and the school sends you out that uh, uh, I-20 form, they also enter all your information into CVIS, and then this is how everybody keeps track of you while you are in the United States. So as soon as the courses begin at your university, the school will enter into the SEVA system that yes, you have shown up to school on time and you started your classes on time. Uh, and each year they have to resubmit that yes, you are still an active student. If for some reason you drop out of the school or you quit or you go back home, they will also enter that information so that everybody in the United States knows whether you're still an active student or not. And that's basically what the SEVA system is. And that's what you're paying that fee for. Okay, next. So, interview checklist. Uh, again, you'll get all of this through the website with the various emails, but th this is just sort of to start putting these reminders in the back of your head. Uh, the things that you will need to bring with you to the interview will be the DS-160 confirmation page. That's the one with the barcode, and that's what you'll get after you fill out the application form online. You'll get a confirmation note of your appointment from the online system, and that will confirm your appointment date and time. And you should show up to the consulate uh, basically exactly at the time that you're required to. Uh, if you show up too early, the guards won't let you in. And if you show up too late, you will have missed your interview time, and they'll tell you to go back home and make another appointment for another day. So. Please make sure that you're there on time, uh, but be patient if you show up a little bit too early because you'll only be allowed in, uh, especially these days with all of our COVID restrictions. Uh, we really have people set to like 10 minute interview slots and if you, if you miss your slot, uh, it, it messes everything else up. Uh, you need to have a valid passport with one blank page. Normally that's not a problem. Uh, make sure that you haven't gone swimming with your passport or it hasn't fallen into the toilet or you haven't had you know a younger brother or sister draw all over it. Uh, you'd be surprised at what kind of passports people show up with. Uh, so it needs to be in decent shape so that we can uh, put a sticker into it and then it's going to last for four or five years. Um, so make sure that uh, it's in good condition. Uh, you'll need a passport photo. Uh, again, we only need one, although anytime you go to a photo shop, they're going to sell you four of them. Uh, we only really need one. It needs to be the two by two inch, uh, the big square one, not the sort of rectangular one. You can see the examples down below. Uh, and it has to be within the last six months. Please don't bring us the same picture that's in your passport and your passport was issued three years ago and you try to tell us that the picture is brand new. So it doesn't work. Uh, even if you applied the year before, you're going to need a new photo and every time you apply, we save the photos in our system so we know if you're using the same picture again. So don't. Just go get a new photo. Uh, some of you who may have applied like more than four or five years ago, might have had previous pictures that allowed you to wear glasses. That rule has changed. No more glasses. Even if you wear glasses all day long, every day, uh, you have to take them off for the photo. And it has to be a white background. So if you are trying to take your own picture with uh, like your, your phone, uh, you can do that, but don't, uh, you know, don't have things in the background. Uh, you're going to have the I-20 form from the school 
or, or the DS 2019 form. Uh, the rules have changed a little bit now during COVID. We don't need the originals anymore for the I-20 or the DS 2019. They can be uh, uh, like uh, scanned to you by email and you can print it out at home and bring it in if it's sort of a last minute thing. Of course, we always prefer the originals and the schools will generally send you the originals, but if something needs to be changed on your I-20 uh, and you need to get it to us very quickly, we can accept email copies these days. Um, the evidence of financial ability generally is if you aren't getting any scholarships and you're going to pay fifty thousand uh, dollars each year for a whole for the for your American University, uh, you might need to bring in your parents' bank account statement just to show that you have enough money to pay for the first year. That's the rule. Uh, you have to have enough money to pay for one full year of your university before you can get the visa. And the amount that you need to show us will be listed on the I-20 form uh, under the, the cost of the school for that one year. Um, normally, it's not a big deal uh, if, if your parents have already uh, allowed you to apply to the U.S. schools. Hopefully, they understand the, the costs as well. Um, we have the issuance fees once again. Uh, again, don't forget, uh, it's up to 305 U.S. dollars for F1 students. So please make sure that uh, you have that money available uh, once you are accepted. Uh, and then you'll also, again, sometimes people are confused about this, the CVIS fee, when you pay that CVIS fee online of the $350, uh, print out a hard copy of the receipt. Uh, we can dig into our system to see whether you've paid it, but it makes things much faster if you just have a hard copy. And you will need to have a hard copy when you arrive in the United States because you're going to show that CVIS fee receipt to the immigration officers along with the I-20. Uh, the I-20, the CVIS fee receipt, and the sticker that we put in your passport, all three of those things combine together to make your total student visa. So. Don't, don't leave any of them behind. Okay, next. So methods of payment. Uh, again, uh, for visas, you can pay with a credit card or a debit card, but you can't use your phone. And the credit card or debit card has to be in your own name. So if you're very generous, moms and dads are paying for all of this, that's great, uh, but they, if it's their card, you won't be able to use it. And then you're gonna have to go downstairs and get them and then bring them back up. So it's sort of a pain. Uh, try to have a credit card or a debit card in your own name. Uh, and uh, make, if not, in a, if, if you really have to use your parents' credit card, then make sure that they come with you because at some point they're gonna be asked to come up to pay the fees for you. You can also do a bank check. Uh, but uh, you can get this from, normally from the Australian Post, uh, and the address sh should be written out to the U.S. Consulate General, uh, and we can only accept Australian uh, dollar bank checks. So there are conversion fees that you can ask us for, and we'll let you know how much you have to pay in Australian dollars. Uh, you can also pay uh, in, let's see, in cash, yeah, th I think that has changed as well. Certainly, uh, at the moment, because of COVID, you can't pay in U.S. dollars. You can pay in Australian dollars, uh, but for some weird reason, the Australian banks don't want to accept U.S. cash anymore, and so they've stopped accepting cash from us, so we, we can only accept Australian dollars for cash. Okay, next. Top two reasons for incomplete applications. Uh, an incorrect photo, if you come to the consulate and your photo's wrong, we're gonna send you down the street to the nearest Australian post and get a new one. So please don't do that. And number two, unable to pay the insurance fee. Again, uh, if it's your parents' credit card and we, we can't process it without your parents being there, uh, oftentimes people say, oh, well, uh, I have to transfer money from one account to another. Please make sure that you do that ahead of time. Uh, and again, uh, I know everybody else is super high tech, but the American State Department can be uh, 20 years behind the times when it comes to paying, and we can't accept you know, phone payments uh, off of your phone. 
We'd love to, but we can't. So don't do that. Okay, next. So what happens, uh, again, this is fairly unusual for our Australian applicants, but every once in a while it happens. Maybe you have a family. Uh, you're married, you have a kid, and you want to go to more likely graduate school. You want to get your master's or PhD, but you already have relatives that are attached to you. Can you bring family with you uh, uh, as the principal applicant of this visa? Absolutely. But you'll need a separate DS-2019 or I-20 document for each dependent that you're bringing along. Uh, you can have a spouse, you can have unmarried children up up to the age of 21. All of them are totally fine. Um, uh, and you don't necessarily have to show any additional resources uh, at the moment, but you have to be able to explain how they're going to survive in the United States. Um, let's see. Yeah, the only thing that's a little bit different about the US and Australia is unfortunately the US does not accept common law marriages. So if your relatives want to be part of your family as your spouse, uh, you have to be legally married. Uh, common law, uh, unfortunately, doesn't apply in these situations, so they would not be eligible for an F2 or a J2 visa as a dependent. Uh, but children are fine. Okay, next. How long can you stay? Uh, again, this is kind of uh, also sometimes confusing for, for people when they see the stickers in their passports, and this also is confusing even for the normal B1, B2 tourist visa. In general, for any Australian citizen using an Australian passport, the paper sticker that you're going to get in your passport is going to be valid for five years. That's for a B1, B2 visa, that's for uh, a J visa, and that's for an F visa. Five years is the date that's stamped in the, in, on the sticker that goes in your passport. But that is overridden by the dates that are printed on your various forms. So if you are a tourist and you're, you are, you're going on your B1, B2, your visa is good for five years, but when you enter the United States each time, the immigration officer stamps a date in your passport and tells you how long you can stay on that trip. Normally, it's good for six months, and you have to leave the United States before six months runs out and then come back in for another trip. Uh, for the F and the J visas, these dates are stamped in uh, on the I-20 forms or on the DS-2019 forms. Generally, the DS-2019 forms will have shorter dates because they are only good for, you know, short-term exchange programs. So they might be good for just a couple of weeks or maybe up to three or four months or maybe a year, uh, but generally shorter than for the I-20 dates, which normally are going to be, if you're going to a community college, the session will, the, the dates will be good for around two years. And if you're going to a four year college or university, the dates on the I-20 will be four years long. Um, why do we give you an extra year uh, off if you're going to a four year university? Well, because as some of you will learn, it sometimes takes a little bit longer to finish than just four years. Uh, and so the visa sticker in your passport allows for an extension and you can get the extension from your university uh, if you need it. And then that way you don't need a new sticker for that last year. Um, in terms of entering and leaving uh, either before your school or after your school, um, when you get the, the visa sticker in your passport, it'll be valid from the day that you have your interview. And we in the consulate cannot print the sticker more than 120 days before the official start date of your school, which is on the I-20. But you cannot actually enter the United States more than 30 days before the start date on your program. So if your start date is September 1st, uh, you can only enter the United States on August 1st 
and we can only print your visa on June 1st. Does that make sense? Hope so. Um, after you finish, let's say you've graduated uh, at the end of May, uh, for F1 students, you get a, an additional 60 days after the end of your, of your school to clear out your dorm room and sell all your furniture and sell your car and then move back home. For the J1 and M1 students, you get an additional 30 days, either to travel around or, or not. So, uh, so that's, that's how that works. Okay, next. How are we doing on time? 8.07? Okay. So just to give you an example, the, the start dates on the I-20 uh, are listed right in the middle on the left side. Next. Oh, let's see. And on the DS-2019, the programs are also right in the middle on the left-hand side. We have a question from Mitch. If I'm going to a community college, is my F-1 visa only valid for two years or five years? Uh, I'm hoping to move to a, a, from the community college to a four-year school. Great program. Again, uh, all F-1 visa stickers in your passport will be for five years. Uh, and as long as you stay in the United States, you can transfer from one school to the next and the visa sticker is totally fine and you'll just get a new uh, F1 form and they'll change it in CVIS and you're good to go. Uh, and so that's fine. If you come home in between uh, and you want to get a new visa with the new school, you can totally do that. Uh, as well, that's fine too, but the visa sticker that's on your, uh, that's in your passport will always be for five years. Okay, all right, next. Can you stay longer? We've talked a little bit about that. Uh, on ESTA visas, uh, visa waiver programs, you can't stay longer and you can't change status. Uh, yeah, okay, I think you can skip that. Can you work? This is a common question for both F and J visas. Uh, yes, uh, but normally it's only on the F visas that you'll be working on campus. The J visas, you normally, are, it's such a short program that you don't have time. Uh, and normally the regulations limit work to a maximum of 20 hours per week on campus. So you, if you're a student on campus, you can work at like the library or you can work at the, at, the, at the food court, but you can't go off campus and get a job at the local McDonald's. It has to be on campus. Um, so check with your university and your, your international student advisors uh, for jobs that are possible if you think you're gonna need a job. Um, and uh, I worked uh, very many times uh, at the food services and it was great because you can get uh, free meals uh, that way and it saves you some money. Um, can you do unpaid internships? Um, yes, it sort of depends on whether it's part of your school program where they may require unpaid inter internships or if you just want to do it during your summer break, that's fine. Um, as you can see here, you can work 40 hours a week during the summer uh, and, and school holidays. Um, so if you, if you can get a paid internship, that's oftentimes allowed, uh, but during the school year, uh, it, it needs to be part of the academic program, so uh, if it's going to be paid. If it's unpaid, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Okay, next. Before you go to the U.S., um, please make sure that you visit your doctor and get your, do a dental checkup. Uh, medical care in the U.S. is horrendously expensive and you oftentimes you'll have access to the student health services on campus but they're limited uh, and whether, you're in, whether your travel insurance will cover uh, dentist stuff is, is oftentimes debatable. So it's generally always better just to get all that stuff at least checked up before you go and have all your regular cleanings and everything before you head off to the U.S. Um, uh, tricks as well, photocopy everything. Uh, and of course, uh, this is sort of old school, 
Uh, if you photocopy it, you'll have a hard paper copy. Um, I know we can move into the 21st century now. Take pictures with your phone of everything and then upload the pictures into a number of different places that you can access uh, from the web. Uh, either, you know, store them in your Gmail account or send the pictures to your parents or whatever so that you have copies of everything in case uh, something gets lost. And it's always easier to replace things if you have a copy of it. Um, uh, you can get U.S. cash ahead of time. Uh, some, I guess, banks uh, in Australia, at least they used to sell U.S. dollars. But even this is kind of old school. Now, if you have a, a credit card or an ATM card, there are ATMs everywhere in the United States. Just, uh, you know, uh, withdraw money as you need it from the ATMs once you get to school uh, and you will be fine. Um, you can register online with DFAT. They have a similar thing that the to the to what we Americans have. When you go overseas, you can register with your Department of Foreign Affairs and that way they can keep track of you in case there's a natural disaster or an emergency. Uh, the website address for that is smarttraveler.gov.au. Uh, and basically anytime you leave Australia, you should register with them and that way then they know where you are. Uh, okay, next. Uh, Hi. other considerations. Yeah. I'm, I'm just letting people in the room. Hi everyone. This is Samantha. Uh, Mike's just finishing up the visa section and then we'll start with part two. So, um, yeah, I'm almost done. Thanks Mike. And, uh, Sam will, uh, We'll talk a lot about this in the next presentation anyway, so that's why I'm going kind of fast. Uh, let's see, if you've been admitted to a community college which isn't your first preference, can you switch colleges after obtaining a visa or do you have to reapply for a new visa? Um, again, it sort of depends on where you are in the process. Uh, if you get accepted to one university and you go through the whole visa interview process uh, and then you change colleges before you even leave Australia, that's kind of weird. Um, but if like you spend the first year at a college in the US and you decide that's just not right for you and you want to switch to another school, um, you can do that without ever having to come back to Australia. You can just go to the new school and they'll register you in SEVIS and you're fine. If you come home, then you would probably need to get a new visa, but as long as you're in the US, you can change schools. I hope that answered the question. If not, uh, just a keep asking. Um, other considerations, uh, again, Sam will talk a lot about this, but uh, you definitely need to have medical insurance and many schools will require it or include it as part of their tuition. Um, banking, you can open up a bank account if you want. Tipping, uh, read the internet, there's a whole thing on tipping. Uh, I love Australia. You don't tip, it's great. I wish the US would adopt it, they don't and it's gotten totally ridiculous. So when you go to the US, initially you think, wow, restaurants are so cheap here. And then at the end of the meal, you get a bill and then they expect you to add an extra 20% uh, oftentimes onto the, the bill, uh, which you don't see at any point until the end of the night. And if you claim that you're you know, Australian and we don't tip in Australia, then you know, the waiter might throw a plate at you or something. So uh, it's pr tipping is pretty mandatory in the US. So don't think that you can skip out on it. Just add it, uh, just expect it when you go out to eat. Uh, drinking age, ha <laughs> ha sorry again. Uh, drinking age in the United States, 21 years old. And despite all the American movies that you've seen about underage drinking, uh, they are very strict and uh, the universities especially, uh, oftentimes have rules where if you're caught drinking, you can actually get expelled. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Driving, uh, you are allowed to drive in the United States uh, and you can bring your Australian driver's license with you, but probably, I, I'm not sure, it, it varies from state to state and county to county, uh, and you'll have to check when you get there, but you, you can initially drive for a few months on your Australian driver's license, and then you'll have to oftentimes uh, apply for the local driver's license wherever you are. Um, uni systems, papers versus exams. Sam will talk more about that and she'll also mention about culture shock. Okay, next. I'm trying to go by really fast here. It's so exciting. Uh, Sam has the same slide, so go on to the next one. 
And then final thoughts, uh, there are tons and tons of links and websites that you can go to, uh, but uh, it, education in the United States is amazing, and we have thousands and thousands of different schools, each one different from the next, so it's oftentimes more difficult to figure out where you want to go rather than uh, actually the, all the rest of the process combined. So uh, good luck, and if you have any questions about visas, you can always contact the, the nearest consulate to you. Uh, keep in mind, uh, for anybody that hasn't, hasn't heard of this before, we have one U.S. embassy, that's in Canberra, and we have three U.S. consulates in Perth, Brisbane, or Perth, Melbourne, and Sydney, and you can only get visas at the consulates. The embassy itself doesn't offer visas, so uh, you'll be needing to go to one of those three cities uh, to get your visa. And we're done. Sam, yeah, thanks. <laughs>